Um, let me get the uh, beginning. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for having me and for uh, coming to this uh, very important event that we host once a year. But uh, you know, there's a lot of information here. I'm going to try to go through it as uh, quickly and as methodically as possible so that everyone can extract some pragmatic thoughts about this. But in keeping in tune with you know climate, technology, the environment, um, that's kind of been a theme that's been around since like the early 60s. And um, hopefully when we go through some of these slides, uh, just bear in mind a couple of things while, while I take you on this journey on, on an introduction to switch mode power supplies and why we're living in a really exciting time right now. Um, these are some of the things I'm going to be covering today. Uh, for the most part, it'll be a little bit about myself, my unique experience, um, some patents that I've developed with that experience that I've gained. And um, then we're going to just dive into, you know, power conversion, how this all ties in with, you know, reducing our carbon footprint and making uh, a lot of the consumable products, particularly now that we can all relate to the automotive industry. Our removal and dependency from fossil fuel is the, the main thought here. And then we're going to dive into some other areas of, uh, you know, topologies, magnetics and controls, um, just to give you a, an understanding of how all these things tie together. A little bit about my background. Um, I'm Cuban. I came to the United States uh, in the early 80s. And, um, you know, my dad was a radar engineer in Cuba, unfortunately, due to the political tensions that were there, um, we left the country. And uh, it is, I feel very fortunate that I was living at a time where there was um, in, in Cuba that, that we call te technological disobedience, if you will. Um, and what this basically means is due to the necessities that are in the country, since they can't really produce much things, we ended up, um, I grew up actually, my dad my dad's toolbox was like my toy box, essentially. I didn't have a lot of toys growing up, um, but I wouldn't trade that for the world because it was the best school uh, for me. And, um, you know, I was able to, through his learning and mentoring, understand how to, you know, reuse, repurpose, redesign and invent. Uh, in Cuba, we have a phrase for that. It's called resolver, which means to resolve with what you have. And in many ways, it's 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 unfortunate that that has occurred in the island for so long, about 63 years now. Um, but in the United States, there was always the same parallel with, you know, how can we make things more efficient? How can we evolve, make things more greener? Um, and uh, you know, I grew up in an era where where that was, uh, you know, a common thing, and uh, being exposed to that at such an early age helped really hone my skills as a as an engineer. And sometimes I feel like uh, the career chose me. I didn't chose the career in many ways. Um, but to the far right uh, on the top of this slide, you can see uh, one of the things that me and my dad used to get involved with was repurposing. Uh, Manuel, I'm, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. Are you meaning to show slides? Uh, yeah, can you see the slides? No, we're not. We're not seeing the slides, and uh, okay. you should be able to share your screen. Uh, let me look at that. For some reason, let's see. Where are they? Don't see where I could share this. Oh, here it is. Share the screen. There we go. Share. Can you see that now? Yes, we can see it now. No. Okay. You may want to put it in presentation mode <laughs> so we can see. Yeah, there you, there you go. Can you see it now? Perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, geez, oh, I apologize. I thought that that was turned on. <laughs> but anyways, uh, just to recap what I just said, uh, we're keeping in tune with climate technology and the environment. And one of the interesting things that are that is happening right now in our times is uh, these things we call switch mode power supplies. Everything that we use requires some form of power, either to convert it, extract it, manipulate it, just to power all the devices that we have. And the ultimate goal here is to obviously erase our carbon footprint and uh, eradicate or eliminate our dependency on oil. 
Um, this is the agenda that I just covered before about we were we were going to cover you know some of my background, te patent and technology, uh, and how power electronic plays in this entire realm of uh, you know saving the environment and making things more greener. Um, this was the slide uh, where I was talking about my background, my education, and a lot of my active memberships right now. And as I was mentioning, uh, I feel very fortunate that, you know, I came from Cuba at a time where, where things were not politically right, but we were able to capitalize on that. And as a youngster, I was helping my dad, uh, you know, get involved with this uh, techno technological disobedience uh, that's been, uh, you know, plaguing the island for 63 years and moving forward. And, um, you know, there's the, the pros of that, if you want to look at a pro, is uh, my dad being a radar engineer, uh, you know, we were able to repurpose, reuse, and redesign. And in Cuba, the, the word for that is resolver, which means to resolve, commutate, take something that would normally be articulated as one item and then repurpose it, re-engineer it, and reinvent it to another. So one of the things that I used to get involved with my dad heavily was repurposing refrigeration compressors. And what you see there on the far right is, um, you know, a compressor that's been, you know, taken apart. And at times we would have to rewind the, the, the commutators and the stators in there. And then we would repurpose that to make an air compressor uh, for uh, machine shops. In the United States, uh, there was a parallel thing going on uh, with the Maker Fair. So you can compare that type of movement in the island with what the Maker Fair is. Of course, the Maker Fair is, is uh, you know, magnitudes and strides ahead of the availability of technology and, and things that are afforded to advance it in that direction. Uh, but, you know, it, it helped hone my liking for engineering. And I was fortunate enough to pursue that um, in my own career. And uh, I take a lot of those lessons uh, and I learned as a youngster and implemented in my design work. Um, some of my professional experience, uh, as I mentioned, I feel like the career chose me. I didn't choose the career because, um, you know, initially I, I, I got my background in, in uh, semiconductor physics and it, I had the opportunity to double major and I chose electrical engineering because uh, that was what I was heavily involved with and exposed to with my dad. Uh, but I was able to leverage that and at the time that I was in college, uh, power electronics, power engineering was not a formalized field. In fact, power electronics uh, evolved throughout the years as, uh, and most people that got in it, including myself, got into it by accident. It wasn't until like the you know late 70s, mid 80s uh, that it started being formalized as a, as a, as a unified field. Um, and it became, it, it became unified uh, basically out of necessity. I think there was issues going on with power supplies in the military and, and Professor Middlebrook in Caltech was one of the innovators that started that entire uh, area of study. And it propagated later on uh, to Duke University. And then obviously it's, it's, it's a formalized field now that, you know, uh, you know it's been extended into, you know, uh, higher power and, and convertible energy, wearables. So it's really grown and it's a really exciting time to be in. But, you know, I, I got my start in power conversion at avionic instruments and some of the stuff that I was designing there was instrumentation clusters for cockpit uh, and aviation equipment. Um, later on, I, uh, I was working in a, in a gallium arsenide um, factory designing uh, RF amplifiers and mimics that went into uh, radio telemetry devices, cell phones. So the neat thing about working there was that I was able to capitalize on my device physics background along with my uh, physical uh, circuit design background. And I was able to appreciate some of the, the, I call it band gap engineering because some of these wafers were, were able to grow them from scratch and be able to contour the, the actual device physics aspect of it so that we can expect an electrical dynamic uh, for how we wanted to use these little amplifiers and telemetry devices. Much later, I was involved in the illumination industry at Dialyte, where uh, when I joined most of their uh, illumination devices, traffic lights uh, and crosswalk um, stop signs and, and illumination clusters were all incandescent. So, they were in the pro LEDs were actually starting to migrate into the into the market during that time period, 
And uh, I was instrumental in designing a lot of the switch mode power supplies that were utilized in a variety of their uh, products. So it's a culmination of all these experiences that where I was able to capitalize a lot of my experience and then take my uh, you know device physics background with my uh, RF background and and divulge that into you know high frequency magnetics and implement that into switch mode power supplies. Um, on a personal level, I also design audio tube amplifiers. In fact, I repair them uh, for a local shop here in my town. And uh, you know that kind of helps keep me in tune with a lot of the products that I design now at the company I work for, Simco Ion, where we design electrostatic uh, applicators and, and devices that are used for ESD control, contamination, and conveyance. So as I mentioned, uh, the company I work for is Simco Ion. They've been around since 1936. They operate decentralized. They're part of a much larger conglomerate company, ITW. They were around since the 1932s. And uh, you know, Simco Ion falls under the electrostatic uh, division of that. And the majority of the products that I'm designing in in the focal group are, um, you know, products that are used to generate uh, to generate a charge or to neutralize a charge in a target area. So, you know, you might think, well, where, where is electrostatics actually used? Well, you, you probably interact with a lot of the, a, a lot of the pro byproducts of the equipment that uses our equipment. Uh, for example, something simple as a, a paper bag. When, when the paper bag gets manufactured, it's actually delivered to a, uh, a manufacturer that will cut and glue this bag, maybe imprint a logo. And the drum is probably like the diameter of the door going into your a room in your house and probably the height of the ceiling of your house and this roll has to be unwound at very high speeds and it goes through different rollers where there could be contact separation and that contact separation can generate a really large amount of uh, electrical charge and that electrical charge could potentially uh, ignite the material damage the material but the other side of it is the safety operator safety you can have uh, an incident, uh, an ESD event that can cause, you know, operator injury. Another area is a uh, medical catheter making. For example, um, you know, uh, sometimes when they make these catheters, they they the the process goes through an injection uh, molding and protrusion as it as they pull the catheter out. There's contact friction. Where there's contact friction, there could be accumulated charges on on the plastic. And um, you can have particulates that are attracted to that by, by the electrostatic fields involved in manufacturing the catheter itself. So some of our equipment is uh, strategically placed during the conveyance process of other material to generate a final product. Um, and this is just an array of different products that I've been involved with. Um, you know, the IQ power right now is the most uh, sophisticated system that articulates a lot of control uh, amplitude, voltage, multi-axis, we call it. And we have several patents that myself and the group have um, accumulated and we've diversified and leveraged a lot of those patents in a lot of the different products that we've manufactured. Um, so one of the things that, that switch mode power supplies gives you and having that type of controllability is you're able to design special control and digital controls to be able to contour the voltage, the current, and the power at the target. That, you know, some of our earlier products had just lamination transformers and we couldn't really control uh, with that type of granular uh, control um, to abate the charge at a target. So some of the earlier simpler devices were the, what I call the brute force lamination transformers or ferroresonant transformers. Uh, that used uh, standard household current, elevated it uh, to a higher voltage, let's say five, six kV, um, just to generate the ions and then get the ions to the target using some mobile transport mechanism, usually air, or by bringing the bar applicator closer to the target. Um, a little, the next evolutionary type of products were these smaller, um, you know, self-resonant type of converters, not switching converters in the root sense of what a switch mode converter is these days, but these were like the initial infancies of switch mode converters. These usually operated at a 50% duty cycle and were self-protected. 
uh, due to the oscillator component of the drive mechanism on the primary side. But nonetheless, it gave you a, 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 an, a, an ability to articulate the control in various axes. So, you know, some of the earlier products that we designed um, fall into two categories. There's the static applicators and then the power supplies that drive them. And, you know, one of the things to take away from the miniaturization and why we're living in such an exciting time right now is that we can actually take these power supplies and really shrink them by increasing the operating frequency. Um, you know, to put it in perspective, a uh, at the top here, you have like a 60, 60 hertz lamination transformer that might weigh eight, nine pounds. You can get the same type of voltage and efficiency from something as small as about a quarter, uh, which is towards the middle of this page here on the right, uh, on top of pulse width modulation caption. Um, just to give you an idea of how how dense some of some of these power supplies are are becoming, uh, just by the mere nature. And then uh, there's been also advancements in uh, silicon carbide switching mechanisms that or devices that are used to um, to design these switchers. Um, so just to explain a little bit more about electrostatics, I had mentioned this a little bit before, but um, anytime you have two dissimilar materials, you can have you know, friction and you can have contact separation. Um, obviously, from uh, basic uh, uh, electrostatics, we know that light charges repel and, um, you know, different charges uh, attract. So when we generate these uh, different pin voltages, we do that sort of on purpose to be able to neutralize the target material that's either being conveyed or moved. Uh, to be processed. In, in the previous example, I had mentioned uh, a paper bag, for example, or a catheter. Um, so you can imagine trying to generate these type of voltages using uh, what I would call brute force transformers. You, you'd end up getting a system that's really large and really big. So switch mode power supplies play a, a big role in, in being able to control this uh, in a nice fashion. And, and it gives you several axes of, uh, of control. Um, so I had mentioned myself and the group have come up with very different, uh, various different types of patented technology that extends from the, the voltage generation to the control contour, to the duty cycle control frequency amplitude. Um, we've really covered a lot of things and, you know, really proud of the group as a, as a whole being able to co contribute to some of these new products. And we keep, um, you know, sort of uh, spreading all, all these evolutionary things that we discovered that we can implement with switch mode power supplies. Um, and one of, one of the major uh, positives of, of being able to do that uh, is monitoring, being able to give the customer, for example, a visual indicator as to, you know, is, is there a charge on my web? Because that's one of the major questions, you know, they don't want to get close to it because they don't want to create a fire, create a, a, a safety issue with, with operators and they don't want to damage the material. And they also want to know when to clean it because not, o not only are we abating the charge, but we're also attracting particulates while we're doing that. So there's a maintenance component that's involved with that. So we're, we're, we're able to leverage and pivot a lot of these different uh, control modalities and turn those into uh, simple uh, decision indicators and, uh, and control mechanisms that the customer can see. Uh, this is another uh, patent that, that the group that we have on uh, multiple axis control, interleave sampling, where we actually turn off the power supply uh, and actually take use the emitter pins as a, a metering device to know exactly how to contour the supply for the next switching cycle. So it's like a look ahead forward control modality. Um, and this is the inner workings of a bar. As I mentioned, some of the products that, are, that we've designed as a group originally take the form of a power supply that drives an applicator. But with the advent of switch mode power supplies, we're able to really miniaturize these devices um, so small that now the, the power supply can actually be embedded in the applicator. So where we, would be, where we traditionally would have uh, AC power going into a transformer and then generating five to 10 kV, uh, with high voltage wire to connect the applicators. Now we just have 24 volts or 10 volts coming in, um, creating, uh, elevating the voltage to 510 kV and then applying it right at the applicator. So the customer doesn't even have to deal with wiring high voltage or 
threading high voltage wire to meet their needs uh, for their target applications. All right, so hopefully by now you got an idea of you know how the the breadth and the depth of switch mode power supplies and where, where they can be used um, uh, as far as what I've been involved with it. But um, you know, right now is a very interesting time. Unfortunately, you know, with with the with the war that's going on in Ukraine, we, we've all been feeling the uh, the dependency on oil. Um, and, and there's really been a push. In fact, Biden had his uh, his speech about a few weeks ago talking about, yeah, we need to you know really push the electric car. And that's something that that's a really interesting thing. The electric car is not a new concept. It's been around, ooh, I want to say since the 1900s. Nikola Tesla was probably one of the first ones that created that thought, patented it. He did a remote control battery powered boat in his time. Really, really ahead of his time. The technology was not there, but he proved the concept that it can be done. And here we are in 2022, and I think all these things can be done. I think that uh, you know, it's my view that I think these things don't have a, uh, a certain trajectory map. Like in the computer field, we have Moore's law that tells us clearly you have different uh, chip manufacturers uh, involved in semiconductor, and they clearly have a linear path as to, okay, we're going to definitely make things much smaller, double the density, increase the power, and all that. There's a clear map with that. What I see going on right now is a culmination of, of, of various technologies that are dabbling in the same thought of, hey, we need to reduce the carbon footprint. We have to care about our planet, but we also have to like eliminate our dependence on oil, right? And you know you have some manufacturers that are going with a hybrid electric concept. Some are going with a full electric plug-in concept. Some want to use natural gas. Some want to go with a battery fuel cell type of technology, flex fuel. Um, even hydrogen ha has been entertained, uh, cry cryogenically converting uh, hydrogen into a fuel source. Um, but I think the the root cause or the root interest in all this bears in a culmination of different technologies and leveraging and pivoting all these technologies to how, somehow synergistically work together. Um, from the way I see it, uh, we're looking at like harvest, harvesting this, this uh, power and energy. And at the, at the root of all this is power converters, because once we extract the energy, whether we go with solar, geothermal, wind, oceanic, piezo, vibrational, even electrostatic uh, uh, generators, we have to find some way to convert that raw energy, whether it's through flexion, torsion, compression, expansion, uh, have that, that raw energy go through some mechanical process to eventually convert it into an electrical process, and then take that electrical process and further refine it to power our everyday wearable devices, which is, you know, at the last slide at the bottom there, uh, if you could believe it or not, the human body, uh, when it's at rest, can produce about 100 watts of power. When you're exercising heavily, uh, you can produce almost a kilowatt to two kilowatts of power, depending on how rigorously you're, you're exercising. So, um, you know, wearables is going to really take off a lot. And, and it's, it's a really exciting time right now um, where eventually we're going to have, you know, holographic uh, uh, screens and stuff on, on, on our skin. Um, so it's a really interesting time uh, to really get involved in that uh, area. So, you know, now that we kind of have an idea of the sources of the power, um, I just want to cover just briefly the history of power electronics. So, you know, power electronics, as I said, uh, became mature in the late 70s, and it took off as a formalized field in the mid 80s up to now. Um, but originally, it dates back to the 1900s, you know, the the original um, power converting machines were rotational machines. Um, these were just, uh, you know, electromagnetic machines that were either wound to generate DC or or separately excited to generate AC. Most of them, uh, most of those designs haven't really changed fundamentally since the 1800s, 1830s. Um, there's been obviously newer materials. Um, refinements and inventions and how to apply that technology using more modern techniques, but fundamentally that hasn't changed. In those days, if you wanted to take, let's say, DC power from a dynamo 
and generated it through a magneto for AC, you'd literally have to couple two rotational machines together and the efficiency was not that great because you have uh, slippage on the rings and and a bunch of other mechanical factors that contribute to the overall inefficiency of that system. Uh, much later on, um, the, the AC conversion from uh, big generators, let's say from like uh, Niagara Falls, uh, uh, type of uh, tur uh, water power turbines, uh, if you wanted to create DC, you'd have to use uh, mercury discharge tubes. In fact, that was the first diode before the, 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 the Fleming diode uh, was created using uh, vacuum tubes. They, they actually had a bulb full of mercury and you would drive a current through it. And the heat of the current going through the conductive mercury on the contacts would elevate the temperature of the mercury and cause it to rise, thus separating it. So you'd have current conduction in one direction and, and blocking in the other con uh, direction. But that was like a brute force diode. And then much later, uh, you know, through thermionic emission, uh, vacuum tubes came around around the 1900s with uh, Edison's observation uh, with the light bulb. And then much later, Levy Forest with the triode. Uh, but again, these were bulky systems. They, they were not particularly used as traditional switchers. They had these devices back then in the tube era called multivibrators that used self-resonating oscillatory coils that were perpetuating. They, there was no control mechanism for these things. They did. They basically were like a spark generator. Uh, and that's, that's basically the control mechanism that was used. It wasn't until the 1940s with the advent of the transistor uh, right here in New Jersey that you know po power conversion actually took off once the the invention of the transistor uh came about and then it, it, in the in the mid 1970s um with the advent of uh, and advances in semiconductor industries and wafers uh, we were able to create uh control chips uh to implement all the control the digital control um the pulse width modulation control and um, the feedback control all in one chip. Prior to that, you would have to create your own analog and digital controllers as separate blocks uh, for whatever power supply you, you were planning on designing. So, you know, in tune with, with the historical facts of how power supplies were created, you had, the, you had the gas discharge tube that was created around 1902. Um, it's almost like, like in many ways, like my career chose me, I didn't choose it. Sometimes the products of the time uh, evolved the technology, which is what I feel what's going on right now with uh, this energy crunch of reducing the carbon footprint and such. Uh, but 1900s was an interesting year because um, Charles Kettering around 1910, uh, he was the one that developed uh, the starter motor and it was advertised as the, as the, as the crank uh, you know, the, the car that has no crank. And back in those days, you'd have to actually get out of your car, crank the uh, the magneto spring that was coupled to the flywheel to break the inertia on the engine. Uh, and you can imagine the amount of energy that's stored in the spring. A lot of people, you know, broke their hands and, and whatnot. There's a lot of accidents. So, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And here we have a case where Charles Kettering created the starter motor, but at the same time, uh, within a year or so, he he created the uh, the first flyback converter, which was the mechanical version of of a uh, of the one of the first converters before transistors were actually invented, um, and that was done basically to uh, create the ignition source for the compression stroke to generate the the ignition during the power stroke of the engine. So if you can imagine, once the uh, the engine was started and the and the mechanical inertia was broken, you'd have the, a four cycle engine uh, going through its uh, compression, uh, combustion, exhaust and intake cycle. Um, you'd have to have a way to synchronize the uh, ignition source to create the detonation explosion in the cylinder to generate the power stroke. So there was uh, you know clever timing mechanisms that were in place and and some of you may or may not remember this but but cars nowadays have electronic ignitions uh that do this uh using optical or hall effect devices but back in those days you actually had a distributor with a cap and points and those points were synchronously aligned 
as to when you wanted this ignition source to, to kick on. And then you would have uh, a, a, an ignition coil set up as an auto transformer to elevate the 12 volts from the battery to something like six to 12 kV to generate a, a, a spark at the spark plug to generate the ignition source. But uh, anyways, the takeaway from this is so that you can get a feel as to, from an evolutionary point of view, uh, how far we've gone uh, from you know mercury vapor diodes to a mechanical version of a flyback converter to when transistors were actually implemented and then later on ICs. Um, so one of the first commercial devices that was able to capitalize on switching converters that were discrete transistor type was the Apple II computer that actually used a, a Cook converter. And then the uh, HP 35 calculator used a, a, a small battery powered flyback converter. Um, so, you know, one of the interesting things about power conversion uh, is that it's multidisciplinary. So it's, it's one of the things that I really enjoyed about the field is the fact that it's not centered over one type of domain. You almost have to be an expert in all of them and know how to pivot and leverage all these things as you're designing your, your switch mode converter. Uh, obviously, you need to know something about control systems because you want to be able to regulate the output and make sure that it works through the entire range of the load that you plan to drive. You have to know how to switch these devices correctly, and you have to use uh, signal synthesis. A lot of these switching mechanisms were borrowed from communication systems. You also have to have knowledge of the electronic devices, the magnetics, uh, the, the thermodynamics of, of, of these materials, how they get... Uh, because they're going to eventually heat up as, as, as you're uh, generating power through them. And obviously, you have to identify the energy and the power source. A, a lot of the things that are going on right now with the energy harvesters and uh, Industry 4.0 is they're actually making in, uh, these devices re extremely low power. So you can actually have um, you know, sensors in a factory that just have the sensor connected, for example, to a heat pipe that runs the furnace in the factory and they extrapolate the heat from that and they can run monitoring systems right off of that. Or they can actually extract the power from the factory itself uh, using vibrational, acoustics, piezoelectric effects, um, any of those type of energy sources. But the, the takeaway from this triangle is that it's a, a multifaceted type of uh, multidisciplinary field and um, you know you have to identify and know how to leverage all these different domains and how to apply them appropriately. Um, but anyways, as an example of a power conversion process, um, you know the the converter process is is uh, classified based on input and output, then the type of current that you're getting out of the device. When we're converting from DC to AC, we call that inversion. Uh, when we're converting alternating AC to alternating AC, we call that cyclo conversion. It could be a different uh, power, current level, or even maybe even different frequency. Something like in an uh, in an airplane, they run on 400 hertz instead of 50, 60 hertz that we use in our house. Uh, alternating current, uh, the conversion of AC to DC is called rectification, and uh, DC to DC converter. Um, that's just converting a DC source to another lower level DC source. So where you would see that is like your cell phone interfacing like your cell phone to your car or to your household where you're taking a DC to DC source and you're trying to power a DC powered device. Uh, but anyways, the picture on top here kind of illustrates the different levels uh, and processes in this conversion. You can have a house equipped with solar cells. Um, those take, uh, you know, light photons, convert them into DC. You could have that array set up in, 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 in series or parallel connections, depending on the voltage and current level you want. Then you want to be able to convert that into some AC source, cycle convert it, sell it back to the grid when you're not using it. You can have bi-directional conversion uh, between the grid and, and the uh, AC converter. And then, for example, uh, from a consumable standpoint, um, you know, you can be home and say, hey, you know, I want to charge my car in my house. So you have to take this little uh, AC to DC converter uh, connected to your wall, wall plug and then connect your phone to it. Or you can just take it on the go and use, uh, you know, a DC to DC converter like these little uh, cigarette uh, style USB chargers where you're taking 12 volts from the battery and converting it to like 5 volts, 1 amp. 
to charge your laptop or your phone. But at any rate, um, you can see that these converters are kind of embedded and they become like mainstream and we use them all the time, maybe not even realizing that we're using it, but uh, something as simple as, as this uh, process here uh, actually utilizes all the conversion processes. So, you know, the elements of these converters, uh, you know, they, they use basically three elements, inductors, transformers, which are basically coupled uh, react uh, inductances on the same um, core and capacitors. So, you know, the reason why we use these devices is because they, they store energy, but they don't dissipate any power, you know? Um, you know, transit ideally, let's say. Uh, the same thing with transistors. We don't use them in the triode amplifier mode, but we use them in the switch mode. In other words, they're always on or always off. And the reason why that is, is because if the device is completely on, the voltage drop across the device is, is zero, even though it can sink a lot of current. So the, you know, the power product is zero. So in, in, in theory, it should dissipate zero power, but they're non-ideal uh idealities that come up in the manufacturer and you have a very tiny small uh, RDS on resistance which can uh, become a nuisance and also interrupt a lot of the switching mechanisms and the energetic waveform so that that's an area that's being constantly involved and I think now uh, the big buzz thing that's going on right now is silicon carbide and gallium nitride they're um, they're past their infancy at this point they're starting to gain a lot of market traction for a lot of high power switch switching but what makes those devices very attractive is the uh the high electron mobility um the fact that they can you know block high voltages and their speed you know uh traditionally resistors are not really used but we need them in order to set feedback servos and sense voltages but they're not they don't form part of the actual switching mechanism so again you know it inductors uh you know they they, you know, the average voltage across the inductor is zero over a period because you have to have both second balance for both both periods. And um, the same thing with the capacitor, we store a charge in the uh, parallel plates, but the overall current in the capacitor is zero. Um, and I just went over why the power product current and voltage of the switches is zero ideally. And then, you know, we pulse width modulate this by, uh, you know, extending or compressing the pulse width during the switching cycle, such that, you know, when we take, you know, pass, pass the output through a filter, we eliminate the high frequency harmonics and we end up with a fundamental DC that's equivalent to the target level that we want to generate. In this case, for uh, a DC to DC converter, if we wanted to invert that, then there would be a post process to take. Uh, for example, uh, the inverters that you would see that run off your 12 volt battery to generate 120 volt, 220 volt, 50, 60 Hertz. Uh, you obviously first have to do a DC to DC conversion on the front end and then do a, a, a bipolar converter with either half bridge, full bridge uh, to generate the AC at the correct frequency on, on, the, on the back end. But nonetheless, fundamentally, you're using all these, uh, all these theories and, 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 and and uh, switching techniques to generate the, the power uh, to the target device that you want to energize. Uh, this is not per se a switched mode power supply, but what I want to illustrate in this picture is that automatic reset happens by virtue of the line frequency that comes into your house. Since it's sinusoidal, it reverses itself automatically. So you automatically get with a, uh, a lamination transformer uh, because you're driving it with a with a sinusoidal source and you're not physically switching it from a DC source, you automatically get a volt second reset with the transformer by virtue of what you're driving it with. But it illustrates the uh, the conduction of the diodes in one direction and in the opposing direction, in this case for full wave rectification. Uh, but because it operates in such a low frequency 60 Hertz, obviously the 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 geometric size of the transformer, has to be adjusted for the appropriate power uh, that you're trying to achieve. But nonetheless, it illustrates the flow and the control and the switching and the reset uh, that you have to bear in mind with something as simple as a full wave uh, rectifier. 
So one of the one of the major things as a as a power electronics engineer that you want to be able to leverage and pivot is you know how, deciding which which topology to use. Um, obviously, I just covered that. There's three fundamental elements that are used in switch mode power supplies, which are the inductor, the capacitor, uh, and a switching uh, mechanism. Uh, but how these devices are oriented dictate the topology. Of, of how the switching converter is gonna work. On the top here, we have a, a buck topology because it takes the input voltage and, and reduces it to a much lower voltage than the input. Traditionally, this was done with linear regulators, but uh, linears have their limit in terms of the power that they can generate. And in reality, they're not switchers because all they are is a transistor operating in a triode mode or an amplifier mode. So you're limited to the amount of conduction cycle you can get out of it. Um, but nonetheless, that's where buck converters got their start with a lot of uh, replacing a lot of these linear converters that we normally see, um, or shunt regulators as they call them. Uh, the next topology, if you start switching the location uh, of the inductor and the diode and the switch, uh, think of that as a three-legged uh, uh, device, although it's not embedded as one device, but you can rotate the location and the topology and how the device are, you get a, a, a boost topology. It's called boost because you take your input voltage and typically it's used to elevate the output voltage to a much higher voltage than the input. And then the buck boost actually does both. It can elevate or decrement the uh, output voltage uh, within uh, a, a certain operational point. And then there's two, there's, there, you know, there's extensions of these topologies. These are the non-isolated topologies. But for example, if you take a, uh, a buck boost topology and you replace that, that center inductor uh, with a coupled uh, inductor winding, uh, of, let's say one-to-one -one in this case, it doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, uh, but you create isolation. And the nice thing is now you have, uh, you know, a transformer that you can actually, uh, tuned based on the turn ratio uh, dynamics of a uh, transformer action to uh, get the output level that you want. So now you're balancing the amount of output that you can get based on the amount of accumulated uh, charge that's on the inductor and the capacitor due to duty cycle control. But now you have another element of, of tuning, which is the physical turns ratio of the inductor. And then that leads us to a flyback converter. And then there's other, you know, this is one of the fundamental isolated converters, but there's uh, several other, there's a half bridge, full bridge, LLC. Uh, and there's pros and cons as to when to use these devices, uh, you know, and that's usually uh, predicated on the amount of power that you wanna get and other, you know, design constraints uh, that the design may require in terms of size, uh, volume, and uh, power. So, you know, you wouldn't use something like a full bridge uh, for something small that's generating, uh, you know, five volts, one amp or something like that. Um, so power is a very big, uh, you know, uh, fundamental core parameter to look at things, but you also have to step back and say, well, what's the most efficient way to do this? So I mentioned that in power electronics, you almost have to be pretty versed in several domains, magnetics being one of them. Um, this is the BH loop that you would expect from a, a ferromagnetic material. Uh, so the key things to bear in mind here are the permeability, the saturation flux density, the core losses, which are typically the width of that BH loop. And um, you know when you energize the coil, you're actually orienting the, the domains in one direction and then releasing them. And in virtue of releasing them, you're storing energy in one direction and then uh, releasing it in, in the off direction based on the duty cycle control. So, you know, when you're designing a, a switch mode power supply, you have to take into account a lot of uh, different dimensional things, the operating frequency, the core air area, the geometry, um, and all these other factors that, that play into you know, designing the particular transformer that you want to do for your application. Uh, in the case of flyback, we're only switching in the top right quadrant, uh, but something like the lamination transformers, although they switch at 60 Hertz and other bi uh, bi-directional switchers, they switch on the top right and the bottom left 
they utilize the full BH loop switching mechanism. And, uh, you know, there's uh, there's different different attributes as to why you want to use that or not, depending on the conduction angle in your application. But, uh, you know, there's really no, no, no Moore's law for magnetics. So a lot of these soft magnetic materials haven't really been up, updated. There's been some uh, engineering uh, design in some of these things, but nothing, uh, you know, uh, radically changing. Like, for example, for the semiconductor devices in the case of silicon carbide and gallium nitride. Um, so again, this is, uh, you know, another area that you have to be able to leverage is the winding technique. It's sort of like the secret sauce in some of these things. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the winding style, the lay, the type of wire, whether it's lits or, or um, you know, stranded wire, a lot of these things play a lot of, uh, add a lot of incremental uh, deficiencies to the efficiency of the power supply. So you not only have to understand the magnetics, but you also have to be uh, versed in, uh, and almost become a, uh, an artist on how to understand how these uh, how these um, deficiencies in winding styles uh, contribute to losses in the magnetics. There, there's been a lot of times where I've, I've had to deal with uh, issues with magnetic devices that were designed to operate in a certain region and all of a sudden you get a different dynamic after this thing's released in production so you have to go back and understand what has changed from uh from a fundamental uh construction of the transformer let's say uh but you know a lot of these cores are available in uh you know industry standard geometries that have been around for quite some time now but uh, what differentiates one from another is basically as i mentioned the the comparison as to what the application is and how much power you're going to be using for that and again uh, on the top there we have the three basic buck boost buck boost and there's one i don't have on here which is the chuke which is the fourth non-isolated topology and then all the ones on the bottom uh have a trans coupled transformer and these are all isolated forward flyback push pull half bridge full bridge there's a several other ones that are not listed there the llc topology because the that one uh has its unique place uh depending on load uh, the re that one capitalizes on resonances of the load so you have to be careful when you design an llc converter to to operate at the at the precise uh quality factor of the uh, filter um so again a lot of these things are dominated relatively by efficiency caught parts cost and performance and there's trade-offs in all those uh paradigms um, and then lastly, th there's there's the area of regulatory compliance. So, you know, before you dive into designing these devices of energy conversion, you got to look at the regulatory compliance markings. Where, where do you plan on selling either the transformer itself, the converter itself, or the appliance that has this converter built into it? Uh, so there's a lot of, um, you know, safety and regulatory compliances that you have to meet whether you plan on selling your device in Europe, Canada, the US, um, also the type of device that is being used, whether it's scientific equipment, what category it falls in, medical equipment, communications. A lot of that has to do with the EM, EMI conducted and radiated test that, that you subject uh, your end product to be tested to. So, you know, a couple of different areas could be home, commercial, light industrial, laboratory equipment. Um, and then finally, once you get to, um, you know, selecting, understanding the, the energy source, understanding the topology, understanding the conversion process, selecting your components, the topology, the magnetics, fine tuning all that, and taking into account the regulatory compliance that's involved with that, then, you, you know, you have to take your device to a, a test lab uh, to be able to categorically test your device for all sorts of um, punitive test that a customer might have. Uh, for example, harmonics coming off the line frequency, uh, ESD discharge coming from operation, uh, from operator interacting with the device, uh, you know, low voltage surge flicker, dips and interrupts. Uh, these are all multi-dimensional uh, testing that has to be applied uh, to your end product. And you have to sort of consider these things on the front end because you could come up with a very, simple design on the front end and then you find out that this is going to be embedded in a consumable product and not being sold as an open frame power source 
And all of a sudden you have to take into consideration all these regulatory um, laws that you have to meet. Uh, and it becomes a very costly at the very end to, uh, to make any adaptive changes to pass any regulatory testing. Um, Manuel, I mentioned before- Manuel, I, I wanted to call a, a, a five minute uh, warning. We got five minutes, we had a hard stop at 3.30 so people can get to the uh, keynote speaker at 3.40. Yes. So just wanted to, to let you know. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm just wrapping it up right now. So as uh, in keeping in tune with the evol evolutionary process of, uh, of these devices, the SG-1524 is the first device in 76 that was designed that embedded uh, the PWM converter, the feedback control servo, and the sense voltage uh, translators all inside one IC chip. Um, and this was uh, actually done on teletype machines, fax machines, essentially. Uh, what we have here is a commonplace TL-494, but you find all the classical requirements that you would need to build any switch mode power supply. You have an, uh, a baseline oscillator to generate um, you know, your pulse width modulation. You have your gate driver, digital gate drivers to drive your uh, switching uh, semiconductors. You also have error amplifiers. In this case, we have two. You can dedicate one for voltage or for current uh, convergence or for other error detection you might have, and then you have an internal voltage reference. But you can imagine all these devices uh, being designed prior to the 70s as separate entities, now embedded into a, a tiny chip about the size of a dime. Um, you know, So uh, you can appreciate that. Anyways, this is a schematic of a, um, uh, a fax xerography machine, a photocopier essentially, that has all these elements already bedded in it. It has the PWM controller we just discussed, a feedback servo that's uh, associated with the op amps, uh, error amplifiers that are internal to the VM controller. And we have the magnetic device. And then we have the switching device. In this case, uh, it's one transistor driving a single winding. So it's a flyback converter and they use a voltage multiplier to generate the electrostatics to capture the image on the drum as you make a photocopy of it. Um, and then finally, to get a, a, a feel on how the size and the dimension of this, I had mentioned that I'm involved in a lot of audio amplifier design and I build my own tube amps. Um, this was a challenge to myself to build a filament uh, power supply for a stereo uh, tube amp. Um, you could see that the biggest device on here is the lamination transformer, uh, you know, weighs anywhere between the uh, you know, nine pounds or five pounds, depending if it's the audio output, and you need two of them. So off the bat, you have about, you know, 10 pounds worth of, 10 or 20 pounds worth of transformer stuff. Um, so I was able to redesign this circuit, at least the power supply section of it for the filament transformer. So I was able to reduce the cost of, a, um, of the power transformer from $90, it weighed 90 pounds, can generate 50 watts, to a buck converter that can operate at 50 kilohertz, cost $8, weighs about three quarters of a pound and can do the same articulated uh, power in, uh, in a much condensed uh, you know, uh, density. But uh, you can get this, obviously I could get this more compressed. This is more of an experimental investigation, but you get a feel for dimensionally how small these things can become. Uh, and then this is act this actual schematic of that. It was a buck converter, some of the calculations that were done to generate that. Uh, and I used the TL494 converter I see that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, these were some calculations I had done, uh, trade-offs in terms of increasing the frequency to reduce the, the uh, inductance value. And if I operated at a much higher voltage, I would need a much larger inductance value. So it was uh, sort of general uh, paperwork calculations, but uh, uh, all in all, this is the actual power. I got about eight Watts out of it. So, you know, it worked pretty well. This is some of the benchmarks. The top is the switching mechanism. The bottom is the PWM uh, turn on signal, uh, square waves and whatnot. And then I calculated the percentage error for that, which came out pretty close. I believe the, I was shooting for 6.69 volts, I actually got 6.3. So it was a 5% error difference between calculated and actual uh, building it, but it worked fine. There was no hum. And, and the beauty of using this device is uh, 
you know, something that plug tube amplifiers is 60 hertz hum. You have no hum. You're operating at 50 kilohertz. You're extremely far from that. So yeah. uh, anyways, this is right. uh, the right. chassis I plan on putting it in. And for those who are interested in more reading, uh, I've separated some suggestive books here. These are books that I've read that are particularly uh, just on theory. These are more on physical practice of building switchers and all sorts of switch mode power supplies. Uh, again, these are some additional ones, some of my personal favorites. And uh, I appreciate for your time, my apologies for the beginning of our slide that we missed no, a few no of the problem. slides. 